Thank you, Chief Wyeth Jesse, Dr. Conti Pedroza, Fred Podesta, and Dr. Clover Cobb for joining me today to talk about plans for increasing in person learning. Last week, we launched a new web page to make it easier for families, staff, and students to learn more about our phased approach to bringing back more students to buildings starting March 1. A lot of the information on our new web page has been shared before, but we hope this new format can be a one stop shop for our community to learn more about in person planning. However, there are some updates that I want to highlight. First is the timeline for return. Our plan to increase in person learning for students in grades pre K through one and students enrolled in special education intensive service pathways starting in March. Students enrolled in special education intensive service pathways will be prioritized first for a phased in return to school buildings and classrooms. While we think negotiations for intensive service service pathways will support a March 1 start, start date, it is unlikely for pre K through one. Negotiations for this are also underway, but I anticipate that these students will have a start date later in March. The second major update is the schedule for pre K one students. Families and staff have shared how important it is for students to remain with their current teacher. We also recognize that some teachers may not be able to return to in person this spring. To prioritize the current relationship between students and their classroom teacher, we have shared a proposal with SEA, our labor partner, that keeps students in an A or B group with two days of in person instruction for each group. While any change from remote to in person will cause a shift in classroom teachers, this model would be the least disruptive. We continue to bargain with our labor partners about these plans. We're scheduled to finish bargaining in mid-February and we'll share any updates to this timeline with families by February 22nd. Throughout our district's response to COVID-19, the health and safety of our community has been our top priority. We have followed the recommendations of public health experts, including starting this school remotely. Since then, experts have learned a lot about the transmission of COVID-19. The Washington Department of Health has since recommended phasing in small groups of students, starting with our youngest learners and students receiving special education services. We're planning on doing exactly that starting in March. And many of our families and staff have asked why plans have changed throughout the district's response to COVID-19. Chief Jesse, can you shed some light on that? Sure, thanks a lot, Superintendent Janelle. One of the most frustrating things about COVID-19 is just how much change there has happened over the past year. Seattle Public Schools is no different. Like you, we're responding to the most up-to-date guidance from public health experts as they become available. We talk to our local healthcare experts who help inform us about all the changes that have taken place, anywhere from how we need to have our health and safety protocols to our testing, and then now most recently about the vaccination. We know a lot more now than we did back last March. Schools are not the high transmission zones that we all thought they were. With the proper precautions, we will and can bring students back. Back to you, Secretary Janelle. Thank you. Um, I know that the changes have been disruptive to our school communities, and I really appreciate the patience, understanding, and creativity shown by our students, families, and educators as we get through this pandemic together. One question I've seen from families, though, is why our phased approach to returning might look different from other school districts here in Washington or beyond. Um, Chief Jesse, can you explain why other school districts may or may not be bringing back different groups of students at different times? Yeah, sure, thank you very much. Uh, so different districts have different configurations uh, and they also have different cultures. Uh, here is the largest district in the state. You know, we're able to um, bring back some small small groups of students here, students with IEPs. Um, in other districts, they're bringing back uh, smaller groups of students than just even um, what we have planned. And they're able to pivot uh, in ways that um, we are uh, working towards, but we also know that we need to uh, look at things like transmission rates. What are they for our particular region here in King County in the city of Seattle? Uh, we also know that we have our own operational needs and then of course, uh, our negotiations with our collective bargaining units. Uh, the key thing here is that we've been listening to our families. We've had a survey 
We've received information back and now we're hoping uh, to take further action on that again with our labor partners um, and, and the rest of our staff. Yeah, and related to that, we've seen a lot of questions about why this group of students was chosen to return first, specifically for our students receiving special education services. Dr. Pedroza, can you share why students in intensive survey service pathways were prioritized? Yes, um, thank you. Um, we actually prioritize in our intensive service pathways um, SEL, which is our social emotional learning classrooms, moderate intensive, focus, distinct, developmental preschool and medically fragile. Um, we worked really hard to ensure that we were following guidance from D the Department of Health and we focus as solely on the students most in need of services uh, related within our special education uh, service pathways. Uh, we believe this reflects the values that we really talked about in our June engagement sessions. Over 100 families, including SEA, central office staff, uh, principals, uh, and community members came together and identified groups of students that we should prioritize um, if a phased small group uh, strategy was needed. Um, and if your student was not categorized in this group, but you think they do require in-person services, please contact your IEP team. And we currently do have students being served uh, currently in the system through that process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, a lot of our planning's also centered feedback from our families and staff. Um, Chief Cod, do, could you share some of the ways that we have worked with staff, educators, and our labor partners throughout this entire process? Sure, thank you, Superintendent Juno. So as Dr. Petroza mentioned earlier, we did have June engagement teams that included families, educators, uh, Seattle Education Association leadership, um, and we currently have an MOU or a memorandum of understanding that is in place um, that says we are in a fully remote model with the exception of students whose IEP teams have made a determination about in-person services. So any change to that instructional model does require negotiations with SEA. And so we are in those negotiations. We meet Tuesday and Thursday, um, and we have shared a formal proposal and a plan for bringing students back in person. Um, and all of that information is shared on our website, our proposal is on our website. And so um, that's how we work through this process. Great, um, thank you. Yeah, and please check out website. We have a lot of information, frequently asked questions. We have graphics now. and. And as, as you heard Dr. Codd say, we have um, our negotiation um, bargaining stuff up there as well. And, you know, since we've shared this updated plan, one of the questions we've heard from staff is how are how educators supporting this next group of students returning will provide instruction to students remotely and in person. And so Chief Codd, do, do you have any information to share about that? So here's what I can tell you. It's extremely complex. So um, the number of students and families who say they'll be returning to Seattle Public Schools um, somehow does need to match up with the number of staff who also are allowed to provide in-person services. So right now we know that about 50% of our families are telling us that they would like to come back to school and receive in-person services. And 30% of our staff are telling us they will need to receive some form of a remote accommodation. So as we get closer and closer um, to nailing down the instructional model in bargaining, we'll be able to match up who are the students who are coming back, who are the teachers that are able to come back, who are the students who will be remote, who are the teachers and staff that will need to um, have be considered for remote accommodations. And in that process, one of the things people have asked us is, Will teachers be asked to teach the in-person students simultaneously with the remote students? And that is not the model that we have put on the table. We believe that there will be some shifts in classroom teachers, but we believe that uh, the model we've put on the table right now will be the least disruptive and allow that continuity and that relationship between the classroom teacher for the most part and the students that they have currently. That's great, thank you. Um, so still a lot of moving pieces. That's a sort of a general, uh, rule, but everything throughout this pandemic has been full of uncertainty and moving pieces. Um, and, you know, we continue to work on making sure that we're tightening things as we go along. Um, 
To prepare a return, to pour a return to our buildings, our staff have done a lot of work to reformat those buildings to keep our facilities um, safe. Um, Chief Podesta, could you share some of the changes that your staff have been working on and some of the changes we've made in our schools? Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Preparing our buildings um, for a return to more in-person learning focused on three basic objectives. Configuring furniture and layout of classrooms so and other spaces so students and staff can maintain physical distancing. Establishing what are called cohort zones, which I'll describe a little bit about, and then ensuring the circulation of fresh air through our heating and ventilation systems. Classrooms are being set up to generally accommodate up to 15 students and desks and seating and other things are being reconfigured so students can remain six feet apart from each other and 10 feet um, maintain a distance of 10 feet from the teacher. We're trying to avoid having furniture that supports like any kind of congregation of uh, students or others around group resources and some excess furniture is being removed to make sure that people can get through the classroom without having um, to be too close to each other. And then plexiglass barriers are being installed in, in some key spaces where there's an expectation of service like at a counter and, and administrative spaces and other places where they're needed. Cohort zones, we're approaching all our operation of schools with this concept of a cohort, which in this context means a subset of students in the school. So um, we are, element, are reorganizing elementary and K through eight schools to allow multiple cohorts to keep students from um, interacting with each other. So depending on how many students we have, it would be probably more than one classroom that will operate in certain parts of the buildings, um, use dedicated entrances and exits to the buildings and um, have dedicated bathrooms and restrooms to keep. Um, and this the goal of this is to mitigate the potential um, spread of COVID-19. If there is an outbreak uh, or a uh, exposure of one student, um, or a staff member that there's not so much mixing with all school staff and students. So it's easy to do contact tracing and mitigate any potential um, concerns about further spread. And then air quality, we know that um, uh, we've learned, one of the things we've learned over this time is that this is you know, primarily spread through contact um, between people and um, through part um, particulates in the air. And so our goal is to increase the flow of fresh air as much as possible in our buildings, we're using a, a recommended standard of 25 cubic feet per minute per person of fresh air moving through spaces that are occupied. And to do this um, at all our schools, facility staff first inspected all the systems to make sure they're working as designed, that there weren't any outstanding um, work orders. Um, we're practical, we've increased the filtration built into the systems to the highest possible levels. And then mechanical engineers reviewed the plans and the design of all our buildings and how um, HVAC systems are laid out to avoid any kind of cross ventilation where air from one occupied space is going into another to make to increase to make sure that everyone has access to fresh air. In some places where that in an individual room that may not be viable, we are going to deploy portable um, air filters to improve air quality in those rooms. That's a fairly limited space and typically not classrooms, but other kind of work areas in school buildings. And then so that gets the buildings ready to while we know that um, this is not a disease that is normally spread through contact with surfaces. It's more person to person contact. It's still important. It, it is possible. Um, so uh, we are doing daily cleaning at a much uh, planning for a higher level and following um, standards established by the Department of Health and Public Health guidelines to clean frequently touched areas multiple times a day um, to clean um, all common areas multiple times a day. And then again, we're, since we're keeping students together um, uh, for instruction and meals in classrooms, um, cleaning um, the classrooms on a daily basis. All these um, practices also apply to transportation um, and the same way we are lay, we'll lay out school buses. So there is uh, physical distancing when students uh, enter a bus will load from the rear to the front with one student per seat uh, to maintain distance. Buses will be cleaned daily and then the procedures for loading and unloading buses or 
um, parents picking up and dropping off students at schools will maintain physical distancing um, at uh, as students enter buildings, as students um, get on buses to make sure again that we're keeping our cohorts together. And this will be uh, managed with signage and stanchions in buildings and pathways to buildings. So as you've seen in other kind of commercial buildings, there'll be markers on the floor, there'll be paths through the buildings to maintain kind of a dire directional flow of traffic and keep people um, at a safe distance from each other. Thank you. Wow, that's a lot. That's awesome. um, uh, Chief Jesse, um, what about meals and recess? There's been some questions about that. How will this, uh, how will meals and recess work in the cohort model? Yeah, so for um, for us, um, we'll be offering breakfast and lunch uh, for any of our students who are receiving in-person services. Uh, the meals will be served inside the classrooms to uphold the cohort model that Chief Podesta was mentioning earlier. Um, these uphold the pu public health and safety recommendations uh, so that we can decrease, uh, obviously, the access to uh, common areas uh, indoors and then also just the flow of the overall uh, school uh, throughout the day. That obviously also impacts recess. So we are planning literally minute by minute about how each of these school uh, classrooms or cohorts, if you'll have me, navigate the school throughout the day as they get dropped off as they um, and then go out to recess. Uh, we have zone or we will be zoning uh, the playgrounds um, and uh, recess areas for our students. Of course, it's unique for all uh, of our schools. Um, so we have 73 uh, elementary and K-8s. And so we've been working with each of the school to figure out uh, exactly where the classes would be playing. And then we have obviously dedicated uh, playground equipment to, again, help decrease the transmission rate um, by keeping within the zone and any of the materials or playground equipment that students would use. Great, and um, you know, speaking of activity and physical activity and getting outside for recess, there's um, there's also a return to some athletics. And Dr. Pedroza, do you want to give a little update about what athletics and what's happening in that uh, realm of our organization? Yes, I want to share with everyone that we have to assure that health protocols are in place um, and that we have worked really closely with the coordinated health team um, to align to the public health guidance to ensure that um, all our coaches and athletic directors are adhering to um, the, the health protocols in place. Um, WIAA um, oversees this uh, process and in alignment with the governor's phases established at this time, uh, phase two return, which we are currently communicating with schools. Um, and then we just strongly believe, especially with our students and high school students, that um, this is an opportunity while the, the athletic season is very short, um, but that it will provide some social emotional support and camaraderie and um, team building uh, with our young people. Um, and with, we believe with strong oversight uh, from our staff. Chief Jesse, do you kind of want to walk through what happens and what the process and protocol might be if there's a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19 in one of our schools when we return? Yes, this is a very important uh, question and topic that we want to address here in Seattle Public Schools. Obviously, health and safety of our students, our staff and our families is paramount. And so uh, through this, over the course of almost this uh, a year, um, we have never had a super spreader event. We take our health and safety protocols very seriously. Uh, so seriously, we train our staff uh, in these protocols, uh, remind them, we do side checks uh, for making sure folks are um, having the right signage up, that we have masks on, we have social distancing. Uh, so we're out there helping answer questions, making sure everything's all the things that are in place. Uh, one of those uh, protocols is uh, what we call attestation. It's a really a daily health screening that we have for our staff and students. And so it's a series of questions um, that we get from public health uh, that we ask, again, our staff and students to answer uh, uh, each day before coming on site. 
Uh, that way we can screen through if, if any of our staff and students are displaying any symptoms uh, related to COVID-19 or that they have been in contact with somebody uh, who may have a, a confirmed case. So those are uh, really key pieces of information when we get that. If there is a flag, uh, then we have uh, dedicated staff for at each of our school sites, uh, all 104 who turn around, reach out to uh, that particular staff or student, or if they're a younger student, obviously the family. Uh, we ask another series of questions that we have uh, around uh, their contact with folks, um, how the duration, what was the timing. Uh, as you can imagine, it's it's got its own uh, select uh, method of inquiry. And then based on that information, uh, that uh, health expert can exchange that information with the COVID site supervisor. Again, that's we have somebody dedicated to, co uh, to managing uh, health and safety at each of our school sites as, as well as at the district level. So um, if there's a suspected case, we bring it back, we get that um, information, and then we make a number of decisions and moves. Those include contract tracing. So we'll move forward and see other uh, staff or students uh, who may have come in contact uh, with this particular um, individual. Um, and then we have communication. And then we uh, have two other things. Uh, there's the piece of uh, cleaning and disinfecting. And then if, if needed, uh, even closing uh, a school site. So the number of series of steps that we go through, we've been doing this now for, again, almost a year. We've got it down, and I think that's uh, one of the reasons why um, we've had a low number of transmission rates here in Seattle Public Schools, and I anticipate that we will continue to do so. Uh, last note, I would just say we do have some child care uh, uh, providers on site that we partner with, um, and we also have our, our meal sites uh, and so we, these protocols, we work with um, our own mill sites and then the child care providers, again, in the event that someone um, is displaying symptoms related to COVID-19. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And I just have to also say that our principals and assistant principals have been doing a phenomenal job out in our school buildings, following all the protocols, learning as much as they can about the attestations and how our processes work and have really been able to keep any, um, a lot, you know, like you said, there's been no super spreader events and, and to keep the cases minimal, which shows that, you know, we're, there are good processes in place to mitigate any spread um, as, as we are in our buildings. So thank you principals for being the COVID uh, site supervisors and doing such a phenomenal job. So far, we've shared some really good detail about what a school day looks like for our students in pre-K one. Um, Dr. Pedroza, can you share a little bit more about what that might look like for students in both general education classes and intensive pathways? Yeah, I can share um, specifically about the intensive pathways. Um, we are proposing um, an in-person schedule for four full days for intensive path service pathways um, occurring Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, what we're proposing for a pre-K, K, and first grade is an AABB model where a cohort of students would attend on Monday and Tuesday, and then another cohort of students would attend on Thursday and Friday. Um, I mean, yes, Thursday and Friday. And then just to share that all staff are working, um, I'll talk about the special education pathways, that in all these pathways and classrooms will continue to support students uh, where they are served remotely or in person. Um, staff members uh, will be delivering um, a specially designed instruction uh, targeted for students with IEP goals, as well as coordinating with service providers to ensure that students access uh, related services as determined by their IEPs, staff will support students with remote and in-person learning uh, in order to access uh, general education and special education set, set, uh, settings um, as developed by the IEP teams. Um, school-based teams and central office staff will communicate with families uh, regarding schedules and other school-based information as we get closer to starting in person. Great, thanks. It's going to be super exciting to have uh, students back in schools and particularly when they need um, that specialized services. So thanks for all your work in that. Um, I know this has been really a lot of information um, and it just goes to show it's required a lot of planning on the part of our staff and there are so many moving parts. 
I mean, we don't want to overwhelm you, but we also want to provide as much information and be as transparent as possible about our thinking and where we are in the process. Um, so please visit our updated planning webpage at seattleschools.org resources. If you have other questions, please reach out. We're happy to answer your questions as best we can. Um, and right now there are some that we don't have answers to. Um, so I also appreciate your patience. I do want to highlight one last thing before we go. Um, earlier, Chief Jesse shared about the changing nature of COVID-19. We are working to provide as much predictability and consistency as possible, but we will continue to review, refine, and adjust this plan to align with evolving state guidance and our negotiations with our labor partners. If there are any changes, we will be sure to keep you updated. Um, just thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Um, remember to mask up and uh, let's all stay safe.